In today's video, we're going to see how to package an existing application into a Docker image by writing Docker files. After watching this tutorial, you'll understand the process of creating a Docker file from scratch, from selecting the right base image, installing dependencies, packaging, and running the application. I will also show you how to deal with build issues and debug broken image layers. But first, what is a Docker image? Think of a container image like a stack of layers containing everything a certain application needs to run, like OS packages, application files, SDKs, and code libraries. Every image layer is like a tiny virtual disk where Docker stores files for the container. The first layer in the stack is called the base image. This can be a basic operating system, like Debian, Ubuntu, or Fedora, a prepackaged SDK or application, like Python or Nginx, or even a custom container image you created. On top of a base image, Docker can stack any number of additional layers that modify the base image by adding, changing, or removing files and folders. It's important to know that in order to optimize space utilization, every layer contains only the differences with the preceding layer in the stack. For example, if our base image is Ubuntu, and we create a new image that includes an application binary from the internet, the second layer will only contain the downloaded binary and not the entire virtual file system. We're now going to create our own Docker image. The starting point for building any image is the Docker file. A Docker file is simply a text file that contains a sequence of steps we need Docker to perform in order to build our image layers. Think of the Docker file like a cookbook recipe. The same way you would follow the recipe to cook dinner, Docker will follow your directives to cook your container image. You don't need to learn a whole lot to get started. A simple Docker file can be created with just these four directives. From, to select an existing image we want to use as the foundation for our own. Copy, with this directive we can transfer our project files and folders into the image. Run, we can use this to run shell commands during the container build to install packages, compile code, or run tests, for example, and CMD, to specify the command Docker will run automatically after starting the container. For this demonstration, I have created a very basic web application with Python and Flask framework. The application definition is self-contained in the hello.py file and configures a single route for the website index that replies with an hello Flask message. The repository is publicly available, so feel free to clone it and follow along with the tutorial. I will link the GitHub repository in the video description. To run this simple application, we first need to install the Python dependencies listed in the requirements.txt file and launch the Flask app with the python hello.py command. If I run the application now, this is what the homepage looks like. And now, let's package it in a container. First, we move into our project directory and create a new file called Dockerfile with a capital D. This is not mandatory, you can use any name and pass it to the Docker build with the minus F option, but Docker is going to look for a file named Dockerfile by default. We edit the file, and the first thing we want to do is tell Docker what our base image is going to be. As we said earlier, this is going to be the foundation, the first layer for our container image. And now it's when Docker Hub is very useful. We could choose a base OS distribution like Ubuntu and install everything we need ourselves. Or we can head over to hub.docker.com and choose from a wide array of prepackaged images. This is the great thing about Docker. Even if you know nothing about installing the Python SDK, you can still leverage the work of the experts and use one of their containers. Our application runs with Python 3.9. So we search for the Python official repository and read through the documentation page to learn what is the best way to use it. Notice this section for the image variants. This is telling us how to pick the right variant for a project. We have the default variant, which is based on a common Debian distribution, a slim version that contains only the minimal OS packages, or the Alpine variant, if you're interested in creating an image with a small disk footprint. You can read through this section if you have special requirements for your project but for this demo we're going to use the default variant. Head over to the tags section and let's see if Python 3.9 is available. And yes it is, so this is what we're going to use as our base image. In the docker file type from python colon 
3.9. This syntax with from in capital letters and an image name will tell Docker to download the Python image from Docker Hub and use it as the first layer. It's always a good idea to specify a tag for the base image instead of using latest. This way you can make sure that if a new version is released, your container build won't suddenly break because of compatibility issues. Next, we want to copy our project directory into the container. For that, we can use the copy directive like so. Copy, always in capital letters, dot, to reference our current project directory in the host system, and the destination folder in the container, slash my project. The copy can also be used to transfer single files by specifying each file name. We'll see an example later in the video. When we develop Docker files, it's important to remember that Docker will not transfer our working directory into the container by default. We need to tell what to include with the copy command like we just did. Now that our project files are copied into the container, we need to install the Python packages from the requirements.txt file. To run shell commands during a container build, we can use the run directive. It's as simple as typing run and the shell commands we want to execute. pip install minus r slash my project slash requirements.txt. The run directive expects the command to be in a single line, just like in a Linux terminal. If you need to run multiple commands, you have two options. You could add more run instructions to the Docker file, like for example, if I want to install the screen package, run apt-get update, and in another line, run apt-get install screen. And finally, we remove apt-cache files. One thing to notice with this approach is that every run instruction will generate an additional image layer, hence using more disk space. This is fine when you're testing things out, but we can optimize our Docker file and install screen with a single run command by chaining multiple instructions like this. Run, apt-get update, a backslash to continue in a new line, like in a shell script, double ampersand to chain another command, apt-get install screen, backslash and double ampersand, and remove apt-cache. The last thing we need to do is tell Docker how to run the Flask application once the container starts. For this, we use the cmd directive. Type cmd, and we provide the shell command to run the application. Open a square bracket, and type a list of strings between double quotes. In our case, python, then hello.py, then close the square brackets. Keep in mind that there can only be one cmd instruction in a docker file. If you list more than one, only the last one will take effect. The command listed with the cmd syntax will not run during the build, but it's going to be the default command to run in the container when it starts. Our docker file is now complete, and we can save and close the file. To create a new container image from the docker file, we use the docker build command. From the same directory as our docker file, we run docker build and then add a dot as the last argument. The dot will tell Docker that our current directory is the build context. This is the place where Docker will search for the Docker file and copy project files and directories from. Docker will now pull the Python image from the public registry and start building image layers. Take a look at the output and see how Docker has processed our Docker file. Each instruction we provided is interpreted by the engine, executed, and the changes are committed into a new image layer. By the way, are you already subscribed to the channel? Make sure you are if you want to be notified when new tutorials like these are published. Our container build was successful, so let's take a look at our local images with docker image ls. Docker stored the generated image into the registry, and we can now use this ID to run it. Docker run, and we paste the image ID. The logs are telling us the application is listening at port 5000 but if we try to open it with the browser, it fails to connect. Why is that? Our Flask application is running inside the Docker container, and it is a completely different machine as far as our laptop is concerned. In order to access it, we need to tell Docker to forward a local port 5000 into the container to reach the application. Let me stop this one and run it again, but this time specify the minus P flag and bind the local port 5000 into container port 5000. We try it again, and now we get a response from the server. We use the docker image ls command to list all images in our local registry. 
and you see that the new image we just created shows none in the repository and tag column. This is because we haven't specified any tags with the docker build command. Let's build it again, and this time tag our image as hello flask latest with a minus t or tag flag. If we list the images again, we can see it has now the hello flask as a repository and latest as tag. At this point, we can run our application in a Docker container. Let's congratulate ourselves, but we still have some ground to cover. Let's open the Docker file again and introduce a new instruction called workdir. The workdir specifies nothing more than the current working directory in the container file system. By default, this is going to be the root directory, but you'll probably never use it to install your projects. Notice how we had to specify absolute path for everything in our Docker file. We can now simplify that by introducing the work there slash my project just after the from statement. Then replace the copy instruction and use the dot to add our project files into the working directory. Remove the directory from the requirements installation. And same for the command. This seems like an insignificant change, but it has two main advantages. First, it makes your Docker files easier to maintain. If you ever have to change the working directory, you won't need to refactor every single occurrence. Second, if you need to run a different command for the container, we won't have to move into the slash my project directory first, and this makes the container easier to use. Let me show you what I mean. Let's build the container again and tag it with hello flask 1.0. We can run the container with a default command like this, but we can also run the app with flask run without having to move into the directory first. If we try the same with our older image, we would have to use the command sh-c, cd my project, and flask run. Otherwise it wouldn't work. One other important thing to know when developing Docker files is how to debug failing instructions. We already talked about how every line in the Docker file creates an image layer in the local registry. So it's really important to know that if the build fails, we can log into the failing layer to investigate the issue. I'll now make a small change to the Docker file and copy the project data into the wrong directory. At this point, if we run the build, it should fail to install the requirements. And indeed, the pip install command failed. We'll proceed by copying the layer ID created by the last successful instruction and opening a shell in this layer. Type docker run minus it, paste the layer ID, and use bash as the container command. Once we are in, we can try run the failing command manually and investigate the container status. In this case, it's easy to see that the requirements file is not in the current directory. The last thing I want to cover in this video is build caching. Docker relies heavily on layer caching when building and transferring container images. You might have already noticed caching at work in two situations. The first when pulling images from Docker Hub. Let's say we already have Python 3.9 available in our local registry, and we now want to get version 3.7. If we use the docker pool command, we can see that docker knows the two images have layers in common, hence there's no point in downloading them again. The second case, we've seen it earlier in the video, when we tried to build the same docker file twice in a row, and docker did not generate a new image layer, but simply referenced the existing one. You can imagine how much faster a build images is going to be, if you design your docker files to take advantage of layer caching. So let's see why our docker file is not optimal, and try to do better. Let's build the image again and tag it as hello flask 2.0. This operation was really fast since Docker used cache layers, but let's now open our application file and change the hello message to something else. When we run the build again, we notice that Docker was able to use the cache for the first command, but starting from the copy instruction, the cache has been invalidated and all the instructions after that were executed again. Docker is very good at understanding if something has changed in any of the project files. So because we modified the hello.py file, now the copy layer is invalidated and all requirements are downloaded again. This is very wasteful because we didn't modify our requirements, so we don't need to install them from scratch. So let's fix that. The only file we need to install requirements is the requirements.txt file. So to take advantage of the cache, we can change the Docker file like this. We modify the copy to only add the requirements.txt file into our working directory. Then we run the install commands to download our project dependencies and apt packages. 
After that, we can introduce a new copy instruction to include the rest of the application code. Now, because we are copying the requirements files separately, Docker will not invalidate the cache for this layer unless we change requirements. Let's build the container again. Good, and if we now change the application file to return another message, run the build, and this time Docker used the cache for the requirements and apt installation, but invalidated all the layers after the application folder copy. If we run the new container, we see the modified message in the page, but the build was much faster. There will be times where having the cache is not desirable. The docker build command has an option to tell Docker not to use the cache and create new layers for every build. If that's what you need, just run docker build with the no cache option. You can see now that even if we didn't change anything, Docker is no longer using cached layers. And this is the end of our step-by-step -step tutorial about creating Docker files. If you have any questions, leave me a message in the comments and I'll do my best to reply. And if you like this video, you can support the channel by hitting the like button and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching this tutorial and I will see you in the next video.